sounds coming off of this hardcover book with no book jacket. Tuesdays with Maury is not a leadership book per se, but there are some wonderful life lessons in this book. This is not the first time I've read it. I don't think it's even the second time I've read it, but I'm glad to be reading it here with you. Um, just a wonderful book. And seeing as how we're now into chapter 16, if this is your first video, you've got some, some catching up to do. And as usual, I will be enjoying an adult beverage this evening. Tonight, another beer. I've procured a number of new beers here recently, so I'm on kind of a, a an experimental beer kick here. I will get back to scotch, and none too soon. But taking a little diversion for a few weeks here. Tonight, this is the Trappist's Roche, Rochefort, I believe is how you pronounce it, 10, which is a Belgian quadruple style ale. Uh, another import that I will be pouring into my Belgian Trappist Chimay glass after opening it with my <laughs> Chimay bottle opener. Now, Chimay might be the most well-known of the Trappist breweries. Um, so, I tend to compare every other Trappist product to Chimay. This one promises to be outstanding. some of these Belgians are, uh, especially the imports, not the, the not the Belgian style brews from America, but some of these Belgian imports are pretty expensive. This, this is a 11.2 ounce bottle that, uh, oh my gosh, I think I, I adjusted the, uh, label on there. It's so wet from condensation label is loose. Check that out. That is not a strange visual effect. Actually, I should have pretended that it was. Just go like this, take it off camera, and then go like this and go, what? Anyway, I'm entertaining myself now. Sorry. And I lost my train of thought. Don't even remember what I was talking about. Let's pull Expensive. This was like five dollars for an eleven ounce bottle. Incidentally, this comes in at eleven point three percent alcohol by volume as well. That ain't low.
little sounds there. That is incredibly aromatic. Look at that color. That's just awesome. <laughs> Some of you may not consider it awesome. It's like dirty river water, but that's a wonderful color for a beer, quite honestly. Wow, yeah, that tastes just like the, uh, the Blue Label Chimay, from what I recall. Holy cow, just incredibly flavorful. definitely some sweetness in there. Dark fruits. Um, have you ever had a really gooey bread pudding with thick, plump raisins? This is not quite as sweet as that, but <clears throat> the flavors are really reminiscent. It's like a slightly less sweet, gooey bread pudding with thick, plump raisins in a glass. That's the way I'm going to describe this, and I freaking love bread pudding. Oh boy, that's wonderful. I have a feeling <clears throat> we continue Tuesdays with Maury by Mitch Album this evening with chapter 16, which is entitled The Professor Part 2. I would make a movie sequel joke or something right there, but Maury's getting closer and closer to his ultimate demise here. Maury was a real person. If you haven't seen any of the previous videos, go back and watch them. Catch yourself up. So, this promises to be kind of a somber portion of the book. I'm not going to make any jokes here. The Maury I knew, the Maury so many others knew, would not have been the man he was without the years he spent working at a mental hospital just outside Washington, D.C. A place with the deceptively peaceful name of Chestnut Lodge. It was one of Maury's first jobs after plowing through a master's degree and a Ph.D. from the University of Chicago. Having rejected medicine, law, and business, Maury had decided the research would be a place would be a place where he could contribute without exploiting others. Maury was given a grant to observe mental patients and record their treatments. While the idea seems common today, it was groundbreaking in the early 50s. Maury saw patients who would scream all day, patients who would cry all night, patients soiling their underwear, Patients refusing to eat, having to be held, held down, medicated, and fed intravenously. One of the patients, a middle-aged woman, came out of her room every day and lay face down on the tile floor, stayed there for hours as doctors and nurses stepped around her. Maury watched in horror. He took notes is what he was there to do. Every day she did the same thing, came out in the morning, lay on the floor, stayed there until the evening, talked to no one, ignored by everyone. It saddened Maury. He began to 
sit on the floor with her, even lay down alongside her, trying to draw her out of her misery. Eventually, he got her to sit up, and even to return to her room. What she mostly wanted, he learned, was the same thing many people want. Someone to notice she was there. Maury worked at Chestnut Lodge for five years. Although it wasn't encouraged, he befriended some of the patients, including a woman who joked with him about how lucky she was to be there. Quote, because my husband is so rich, he can afford it. Can you imagine if I had to be in one of those cheap mental hospitals? Another woman who would spit at everyone else took to Maury and called him her friend. They talked each day, and the staff was at least encouraged that someone had gotten through to her. But one day she ran away and Maury was asked to help bring her back. They tracked her down in a nearby store, hiding in the back, and when Maury went in, she burned an angry look at him. So you're one of them too, she snarled. One of who? My jailers. Maury observed that most of the patients there had been rejected and ignored in their lives, made to feel that they didn't exist. They also missed compassion, something the staff ran out of quickly. And many of these patients were well off from rich families, so their wealth did not buy them happiness or contentment. It was a lesson he never forgot. I used to tease Maury that he was stuck in the 60s. He would answer that the 60s weren't so bad compared to the times we lived in now. He came to Brandeis after his work in the mental field just before the 60s began. Within a few years, the campus became a hotbed for cultural revolution. Drugs, sex, race, Vietnam protests. Abby Hoffman attended Brandeis. So did Jerry Rubin and Angela Davis. Maury had many of the radical, quote-unquote, students in his classes. That was partly because, instead of simply teaching, the sociology faculty got involved. It was fiercely anti-war, for example. When the professors learned that the students who did not maintain a certain grade point average could lose their deferments and be drafted, they decided not to give any grades. When the administration said, if you don't give these students grades, they will all fail, Maury <clears throat> had a solution. Let's give them all A's. And they did. Just as the 60s opened up at the, opened up at the campus, it also opened up the staff in Maury's department. From the jeans and sandals they now wore when, when working, to their view of the classroom as a living, breathing place, they chose discussions over lectures, experience over theory, they sent students to the Deep South for civil rights projects and to the inner city for field work. They went to Washington for protests, protest marches, and Maury often rode the buses with the students. On one trip, he watched with gentle amusement as women in flowing skirts and love beads put flowers in soldiers' guns, then sat on the lawn, holding hands, trying to levitate the Pentagon. They didn't move it, he later recalled, but it was a nice try. One time, a group, a group of black pro... One time, a group of black students took over Ford Hall on the Brandeis campus, draping it in a banner that read Malcolm X University.
University, Ford Hall and Chemistry Labs, and some administration officials worried that these radicals were making bombs in the basement. Maury knew better. He saw right to the core of the problem, which was human beings wanting to feel that they mattered. The standoff lasted for weeks, and it might have gone on even longer if Maury hadn't been walking by the building when one of the protesters recognized him as a favorite teacher and yelled for him to come in through the window. An hour later, Maury crawled out through the window with a list of what the protesters wanted. He took the list to the university president, and the situation was diffused. Maury always made good peace. At Brandeis, he taught classes about social psychology, mental illness, and health, and group process. They were light on what you'd call career skills and heavy on personal development. And because of this, business and law students today might look at Maury as foolishly naive as his contribution about his contributions. How much money did his students go on to make? How many big-time cases did they win? Then again, how many business or law students ever visit their old professors once they leave? Maury's students did that all the time, and in his final months, they came back to him, hundreds of them, from Boston, New York, California, London, and Switzerland, from corporate offices and inner-city school programs. They called, they wrote, they drove hundreds of miles for a visit, a word, and a smile. They called, they wrote, they drove hundreds of miles for a visit, a word, a smile. I've never had another teacher like you, they all said. As my visits with Maury go on, I begin to read about death, how different cultures view the final passage. There is a tribe in the North, Amer in the North American Arctic, for example, who believe that all things on Earth have a soul that exists in a miniature form of the body that it holds, of the body that holds it, so that a deer has a tiny deer inside it, and a man has a tiny man inside of him. When the large being dies, that tiny form lives on. It can also slide into something being born nearby. Or it can go into a temporary resting place in the sky, in the belly of a great feminine spirit, where it waits until the moon can send it back to Earth. Sometimes, they say, the moon is so busy with the new souls of the world that it disappears from the sky. That is why we have moonless nights. But in the end, the moon always returns, as do we all. That is what they believe. Well, that does it, friends, for chapter 16 of Tuesdays with Maury by Mitch Album. It's not a terribly long chapter, so I think I'll take another drink here and maybe record another video. Wow. So flavorful. So just as a reminder, what I'm enjoying tonight is the Trappis Rochefort Rochefort, I believe is how you pronounce that, Tem, which is a Belgian quadruple ale. And just a mouthful of flavor. <clears throat> Boy. Still taste it a minute later.
it's awesome. Here's your quick reminder, friends, that um, if you're finding some value in what I'm doing here, to please like, subscribe, click that notification bell down there in the corner, and leave some comments on these videos. Let me know what you're drinking. Let me know what you like to drink. Let me know if you've read Tuesdays with Maury before, or maybe what book you would like me to read on the channel. Tell me what your favorite personal development or leadership type of book is. Maybe I have it in my library over here. Maybe I'd be happy to pick it up and read it for you on the channel. We'll see where this goes. So in any case, I hope you enjoyed Chapter 16 of Tuesdays with Maury, and that you will join me for Chapter 17 in the next video. Thanks again.